Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Joanne Kennan, and I'm the Executive Editor for Healthcare at Politico. And with me today for our live Q&A about the 2020 elections and health policy is Robert Blendon, Richard L. Menschel Professor of Public Health and Professor of Health Policy and Political Analysis Emeritus at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. I just call him Bob. Um, we have You can uh, post your questions for Bob and me on Facebook at forum uh, dash H dash S dash P dash H, um, H S P H, Harvard School of Public Health. You can mail them to the forum, one word, the forum at H S P H at harvard.edu. The Q&A is jointly presented by the forum at Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public so we are in a um, unprecedented, um, ongoing ele election day hasn't really ended. We're still in the turbulence. Um, we're still quite uncertain about what next. But one thing does remain clear is we are divided as a nation on the direction of health policy uh, and what's next for us. So we're going to talk with Bob about what the election means for some of the biggest issues in healthcare. That's the traditional issues that we talk about after every election, cost and coverage and how they, div they divide us. Um, but obviously we are also gonna talk about the coronavirus, about racial justice, gun control and abortion, if we can get all that in half an hour. Um, to begin with, Bob is gonna give us, um, and I should say that I'm here doing what I do partly because Bob has taught me a lot about what to, how to think about healthcare and health politics over the years. So he's now going to give us a picture of America's, an overview of America's view on these issues. Um, you know, just how far apart are Democrats and Republicans right now? And before you show your slide, me, it's sort of the mommy and me, you know, how far, are, how far are, we're so far apart. But you can give the more scientific answer. Uh, Joanne, what a privilege it is uh, to do this with you and do this again. Uh, I'm going to try to do a, a weather forecast of where health policy might go after the election with a great deal of humility. Uh, anybody that follows uh, weather forecasts or polling forecasts has to have a, a lot of reserve about what they say about what's going to happen. Uh, and so I want to help people understand what bothers me is that uh, people present various where this is going on, but why? And so you can make your own judgments. And so there, there are two types of news stories that have been floating around. One is that uh, uh, President-elect Biden is going to do sweeping things to change America's health and health care uh, uh, policy over the next few years will be just uh, dramatic. Uh, the other is that we've entered a period of, uh, of gridlock where agreement between the new president and the Congress will be very hard to get. And what I'm going to explain is, uh, and with Joanne's help, uh, both these headlines are correct. Uh, so uh, I'm going to ask Joanne to do a bit of this in a minute. Uh, the president has sweeping powers, executive authority, administrative authority to change many things in health policy. Uh, I'm sure in inauguration day, we're going to rejoin WHO. Uh, we're going to rejoin the Paris uh, climate change. There'll be a whole list of things that the president can do without the Congress. And then there are a whole series of issues that actually uh, do require the Congress. And uh, I want to take you into this uh, world when we're all uh, divided uh, and explain something. Uh, what is this gridlock about? So if you go back to 1994 and you ask people who said they were Republican or Democrat how they feel about what government should do about the big issues that affect your life, they were this far apart. They were not together. They were this far apart if I'm a Republican or Democrat. Now they're like that. On every single answer, and I'll just show you a few of these, uh, uh, Republicans and Democrats uh, give you exactly the opposite answer about what I want the federal government to do over, over the next two years. But this is what people don't really understand. You and I can disagree all the time and it doesn't actually affect things. But what happened is both Republicans first and then Democrats felt so strongly about their views in their own primaries, they voted out their own candidates. If you didn't share my views of what I should be as a Republican or Democrat, I voted you out. 
so what's completely changed, and I have to uh, push journalists all the time about reporters, there's little evidence anymore that the overall polls about where people believe affect the Congress. What affects the Congress is what your own party members believe. Uh, so uh, just a few weeks ago, uh, a, a simple uh, issue, the tragic loss of Supreme Court Justice Ginsburg, should she be replaced before the election? 57% uh, of Americans say, no, wait. 80% uh, of Republicans say, no, do it right now. What does the Senate do in three days? They're moving a candidate along. And so just to be bipartisan here, people don't realize this. They don't raise the issue anymore. But when the Affordable Care Act was passed, the majority of Americans opposed passing it. The majority of Democrats overwhelmingly favored doing it. And so over and over again, what we see is that members of the Congress, the leadership, follow the view of their core party. So there is a chance, and uh, uh, Joanne will go uh, further about this, that the Senate, regardless of uh, uh, the president's win, could be Republican dominated. And the reason why both Joanne and I will say it isn't over yet uh, is that the ultimate decision there is going to be decided in a two special elections in Georgia in January, not tomorrow, in January. One has to do with a member because of illness stepped down early, and the other is Georgia requires you get 50%. Uh, it uh, uh, turns out uh, I share the view that it's likely that the Republicans uh, will get one of those two seats. If they do, they are, are in the majority. And what I have to explain is that the senators who won, who are Republican, do not believe that they won to implement President Biden's agenda. So uh, people get mixed about that, but their signals to themselves through uh, Senator Mitch McConnell and all is our voters didn't uh, uh, want this. I just briefly want to show some data uh, from a slide and then everybody's gonna say, I got it. Uh, I don't like it, but I got it. Can we just have the one slide? So simple questions, uh, which uh, a president like Biden has been talking about, we need universal coverage. All right. Uh, do you think the federal government should do that? 82% uh, of Democrats, yes. 39% of Republicans, yes. Uh, uh, how about the big health reform options? Let's take the ACA in terms of let's fix and expand uh, the ACA. 89% uh, of Democrats want that done. Go do it, President-elect Biden. It's 24% of Republicans, the people who elect the Senate. Uh, for that, how about Medicare for all, which in the Democratic primaries was so absolutely critical, 78% uh, uh, of Democrats uh, uh, support it and 24% of Republicans uh, for it. Uh, for those quickly, uh, when it, Democrats are asked, okay, make a choice, improve, fix, get universal coverage with the Affordable Care Act or Medicare for all, they actually split. And uh, they uh, split along exactly the line. So uh, quickly back to this big division. You say to Republicans, one other word, uh, how do you identify yourself? Somewhere between 70 and 75% say I'm a political conservative. Democrats, somewhere between half to 53% say I'm a political liberal or progressive. Uh, but they are literally equally divided and they're divided over what I rather fix the ACA or do Medicare for all. And the president uh, has chosen fixing the a a ACA. How about simple things which are all over the health policy discussions. We have to increase funding for Medicaid in this very difficult era. Uh, Republicans, it's 25% support and 63% Democrats. And we're gonna to get to COVID in, in, in a minute. And it's very important. Uh, people disagree uh, with each other, not only by party, by geographically. So who do you want to make the big decisions about COVID in this outbreak as it's getting worse? Uh, Republicans want state and local government. Democrats want the federal government. 
Uh, and in terms of scientists, the world that I live in and have a great deal of respect, do you have a great deal of confidence in medical scientists? Uh, and so we're gonna predict in a second what's gonna happen. Republicans are skeptical, it's 37%. Uh, Democrats, it's the highest level, it's 53. Uh, so I'm gonna look just uh, quickly, we can move this slide out. What is this going to mean if Republicans uh, uh, hold the Senate in terms of the things that the president can't change, which I'm gonna turn in a minute uh, to Joanne uh, to really look at. Uh, so uh, uh, this polarization uh, is going to mean that we're not going to have a universal if, uh, uh, health insurance bill in the first two years uh, of the president's term. That cannot be willed by executive uh, uh, action if the Republicans hold the Senate. And we're not going to be moving a Medicare for all debate or a Medicare buy-in or over 60 if that Senate uh, remains Republican. Again, we'll be watching that night in Georgia. Uh, on the uh, COVID area, uh, first, and you can see this already, if I'm a Democratic president, I am going to surround myself with scientists. My office will be crowded with scientists uh, going, talking about this, and every speech I make will quote a scientist, a scientific fact, the scientific recommendation. I also, I'm going to quietly, but I'm going to shift the authority from state and local government and making decisions uh, to, to the presidency, uh, to the national leadership. More and more masks, guidelines for where schools should be open or not, uh, what we do about being on planes or not, are going to more and more be issues uh, of uh, national decision through a presidential uh, 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 task force uh, uh, for that. That is a presidential decision that can be made and, and it's going to go. I want to hit... Um, uh, just a couple more issues about COVID, and one of them is not well uh, uh, recognized. Uh, at the moment, uh, uh, Americans, many moderate and low-income uh, uh, groups, many uh, members of minority communities are incredibly hurting financially because of what the shutdowns and economic slowdown has done to their lives. Uh, they can be helped. For this, likewise, there are many businesses who are just hanging on by uh, uh, thumbnails, uh, and so uh, the, the uh, parties differ. Republicans do not feel that the size of federal assistance should be of the scale the Democrats will. But the thing that is not covered well yet is that what's happened is state and local governments. Uh, are running huge deficits that will show up next year, just giant. And so uh, unless they get major federal aid, uh, we're going to see while the politicians are talking about expanding this and billions for that and Green New Deal or that, uh, cities and states laying off teachers, cutting back non-COVID public health, cutting back on Medicaid, cutting back on mental health services, they will face enormous deficits by the slowdown because sales and property taxes are very important in, in income for states uh, for that. So the parties are gonna differ whether or not there is a bailout to help them through the next two or three, three years. Uh, there are a few other issues I wanna discuss when you ask questions about them. Uh, one will be the fundamental difference and the leadership we will see on racism and disparities here. And when you ask about, it, we will talk about that. But the administration has a commitment and a debt here that will be very, very real. We're going to talk about abortion, the Supreme Court, and what states are going to do. Uh, we're going to talk about pharmaceutical prices, which are a voting issue. Uh, but the Senate, if it's Republican and the president, may not see exactly that. And we're going to talk about gun control. Uh, which is an issue to many voters, and how will that play out? But before we go there, I want to uh, talk and ask Joanne the switch, because while these stories about gridlock goes on, the president has enormous authority to impact. Joanne? 
think the one area where we could see some legislative action is improving public health. Um, that after 9-11 we, and, and anthrax, we put a lot more money into public health. We actually called it a bioterror bill, but it was dual use. It was public health for both, non, for both terror and natural causes. And then during, and we really beefed it up a lot. That was Senator Frist and Senator Kennedy who actually pushed that through. And then during the Re Great Recession, um, it, there were tons of cutbacks. And, you know, we still have public health agencies and counties that are using faxes that I've been told that like hospitals are like printing out things from EHRs and faxing it to their public health community. Clearly, whatever, even if Biden goes to a, a much more nationalized Washington centric consistent approach. I think there may be um, some, there's still be a need for good public health on the ground. And I think that may be one of the few, very, very few areas where we could see legislative, something legislative bipartisanship, maybe on the Cures bill, maybe in the stimulus bill. Um, I mean, Cures 2.0, it's a FDA oriented uh, bill that's going to come up. I don't know where, and I'm not sure it'll happen. I think. Any, we have a very short memory as a country. And, you know, about we have a short attention span. It's you know like twelve seconds. So, as we emerge from the pandemic and figure out what's next and how to be better prepared, I, I do think that's one of the the few areas you could see um, people agreeing. Um, but basically, I think it'll be it'll be gridlock, um, which we're very used to. Um, you know, think we are so politicized. It's not just you know, Obamacare and things like that, they were politicized. We are politicized about basic, you know, facts about a virus. A virus does not, you know, there's a cliche. A virus doesn't know if you're Democrat or Republican. It's going to try to kill you if it feels like it anyway, right? So um, the, the, the politic. I mean, I'm used to healthcare being politicized. I have been surprised by how politicized that masks became a, a symbol of liberty, not a symbol of how do you save people around you and yourself. So, um, but Biden does have a lot of administrative power. Remember that, um, you know, Trump came in promising to hold a special session of Congress, even though Congress was already in, so he never quite got that part of it, and uh, repeal Obamacare on day one. Well, Obamacare didn't get repealed on day one or day two or day three. And I, you know, they spent a whole year trying to repeal it and they failed. So Trump did change the contours of the ACA. He did not destroy it, but he did change a lot of things about it. Um, and Biden, too, can use administrative powers, or executive powers, not his, his HHS secretary and his CMS administrator will be able to use some things that are already on the books. Um, there are many waivers in healthcare for that, that shape state Medicaid programs that shape the ACA and how states can innovate. A state can try to do a public option theoretically, at least with a 1332 waiver. It's difficult. It's expensive. I mean, they've looked at it before. I don't know that anyone will figure it out, but they would have the option or they could get the option if they met certain criteria under these waivers. Um, we would expect uh, to see big differences in the Medicaid waivers. I mean, no, you know, Biden is not going to be pushing for block grants for Medicaid and Biden is not going to be allowing I don't know what they're going to do about the states that have already got their waivers. I've, I've talked to some experts and it's unclear. Some of these things are in the courts anyway. The courts may decide it, but he certainly is not going to approve any more work, work requirement kind of things. So um, and the other thing he could do really quickly, immediately. Well, I mean, as Bob mentioned, he said on day one, he's going to um, go back into the WHO, the World Health Organization. Probably on day one or day two or day three, we'll see a reversal of the uh, so-called Medicare, Mexico City policy, which is um, a global rule restricting US um, aid to um, any group that has like even whispers the word abortion, let alone, it's, it has nothing to do with whether you actually perform abortions. You're not to even have it on your website. Um, and, but, I, and I, but I think the other thing that he will do is um, make it easier. There's something called a special enrollment period. You hear, sometimes hear people are shorthand as SEP. And if you, if you lose your job and your insurance, you can apply to ACA coverage even outside of the regular or, you know, you get divorced or certain other, you, you know, certain other life-changing conditions, you can apply outside the regular enrollment period. Um, but people don't know that and it's pretty cumbersome. There was a request for Trump to just make a big special enrollment period for all these millions of people losing their jobs, many, not all, but many of whom did lose their insurance. 
And Trump did not either open a special enrollment period, nor did he simplify, nor did his department simplify the process of you as an individual if you try to get it. It's really easy for Biden to do. He could create a special enrollment period. He could, uh, you don't need Congress to approve it. You could message it. You could restore the navigators. You can restore the outreach that um, this, I mean, an open enrollment period is going on right now. I mean, if I can't see people watching us on Facebook, but if I ask you to raise your hands and ask if, if um, and I'm, I'm, my battery shouldn't be running low, but when Bob talks again, I will recharge myself. So you will put him. Um, it charged overnight, but these things have a mind of their own. Uh, so I do think that, you know, Medicaid will look different. The ACA will look different. Um, there are things, uh, short-term plans will look different. But all the ways that Trump used his administrative powers to, um, to, to change the ACA, Biden could restore and build on. So, Bob, you take it. I'm getting my power cord in one second right now. <laughs> uh, do we want to take some of the uh, uh, questions that we have? We probably need... Uh, Joanne, can we take a couple questions for you and I? Keep going. Uh, I wanted you to take a few questions for you and I. Okay. Uh, I, I figured out the scientists and they figured out that the reason it didn't charge is the other end wasn't in the wall. So, <laughs> but but I, I was a Harvard undergraduate, so I know that now. Okay, questions. Like, we actually talked about one of them already, which was um, someone asked about public health, and I think I addressed that. And we also addressed um, what, are there any other executive orders that you could think of that I didn't mention? Uh no, uh, I think the thing it'd be uh, visible is uh, is the uh, uh, efforts to advertise enrollment. Uh, that is the people reaching out, the amount of publicity, uh, still people signed up, but you really could have a much more dramatic effort to get people to enroll. Uh, the president uh, could also use some more leverage on states that haven't expanded Medicaid. You could make it attractive for them uh, in, in other areas. Uh, so the Medicaid side uh, 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 absolutely grows. Uh, and the focus on public health, as you say, is likely to grow uh, 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 enormously. Uh, one of the things that Joanne and I would both agree on, when the pandemic winds down, we need a public examination about what we did wrong from credible people. Uh, this could play out again in 10 more years unless we understand why the public health capacity wasn't able uh, uh, to do this. And we've had some bad histories and there was a plan that was prepared uh, years ago about how to deal with this and it just sat in a drawer. And it's really important that everybody, not just the 50 experts, take away what we do to have the equivalent uh, of a protection like being attacked after 9-11 uh, or even Pearl Harbor. We have to be ready and people have to understand what being ready means. Right. I think that's what I mentioned about it. I mean, I do think that they, I, I can't, I mean, who knows how good luck to, maybe they'll get nothing done. I do think that public health is the one thing that yes. um, there, there is public health and maybe a little bit shifting um, more toward primary care and sort of pre prevention, maybe some of those things, partly as part of our discussion, the ongoing discussion about racial justice and healthcare yes. and management of chronic diseases, we may see some of that. Um, I, would, I would also say that in, um, you know, in that short memory that we have as a country, that short attention span, in, in 2003, after SARS, there was, there was research on developing a SARS vaccine, which wasn't needed because you know, we controlled SARS. It was, SARS was less contagious. It was more lethal, but less contagious. It didn't affect, you know, the tens of millions of people we have. Um, but there was research not only on a SARS vaccine, but how to make a universal coronavirus vaccine. And um, it's easier to do probably, I mean, I've never invented a vaccine personally, but um, I've been told that it's easier to come up with a universal coronavirus vaccine that would work not just on this one, but the next one and the one after that, that we've been working for years on a universal flu vaccine and we haven't gotten very far. The flu is constantly changing. This is a more stable virus. And there, so that there's hope that if we invested in that and we stuck to it, we would have something ready for the next one, or at least 
closer, you know, you know, that it would be maybe not every coronavirus, but many features of coronavirus. So that's something that you might see people talking about as a long term sustainable funding to do that because you're not going to do it in two weeks. And that also might be something that's bipartisan. But I really just don't um, I don't I don't I do see, you know, Biden undoing the Trump executive orders and waivers and so forth and probably a little bit more in terms of wherever he can do more coverage, he will do more coverage. Um, but I don't really see, you know, I, I don't think there'll be a, a sudden hallelujah moment. I do think that one thing that's changed, and Bob and I have talked about this before, we as a country still, as a country, not which party, but if you look at poll Americans, we don't think that healthcare is a right, a human right. We don't, as a country, we do not have that consensus. We have reached that consensus on, on pre-existing conditions. Yes. We have, we don't think that healthcare is a right, but we do think that covering pre-existing conditions is the right thing to do. That's a big shift. You can, you know, yeah. quibble about, not quibble, I mean, the Republicans never came up with a plan. How do you get rid of the ACA and keep pre-existing conditions? They never came up with a plan that would actually work, although they promised it or they said they would. Um, but that they have to do that now. They understand they can't go back. Right. And one of the really important things to understand about the pandemic is we thought this was an acute respiratory disease. Um, and in fact, it's a respiratory disease and a car, a heart disease and blood Basic vessels arthritis. and your brain and no, your kidneys. Is, right. right. And it's not just acute. Yes. A lot of people have even some people have mild cases end up with chronic conditions. So this whole issue of chronic conditions and how do we treat them and how do we have to think about health care, those are conversations. And some of that is bipartisan. I mean, some of the issues we've talked about over the years, there are cliches by now, you know, value versus volume and all that. But there's, there's Repu that's not a highly politicized thing. So can you make... Um, can you make some progress toward changing some incentives and more priority for managing chronic diseases and, you know, less of, you know, elective surgeries? Um, you know, how do we pay for things and how do we reward things and how do we encourage things? You might see some um, at the edges. Um, one of the other questions here, um, I mean, I think that Bob, in, in the, the chart that um, Bob showed, I thought one of the, maybe the, the most significant is the lack of faith in science and it's Democrats too. It was, I think 53% thought that scientists would act in the public interest. And, um, and that's not just the United States. That's There's complete been- complete confidence. There's a lot of, you know, it depends right. in some way. We do, right, yeah. But we do see an erosion yeah. yes. um, and that's related to the vaccine. You know, there's a question about vaccinations. Right. Um, Bob, do you want to, um, you know, give a thought. So I mean, we, I, it, we, I, a I thought of vaccination, then I'll say a thought. Racism and health for just a minute. From a political perspective, uh, 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 much of the audience understands the huge disparities that exist in this country. They don't fully understand the political change that we just saw. Uh, if, if you go back, uh, Vice President Biden in the Democratic primaries was not thought as the lead candidate to get the nomination. I didn't think so. <laughs> yes, it was black voters, black political leaders in South Carolina, uh, and then in the South uh, that overwhelmingly voted for him and made him the majority for the Democrat. Also, in many of these close races, uh, particularly in urban states, uh, you're going to find when they actually look at the numbers, the black turnout was incredibly important for Biden being there. And that will be a signal, forget the disparities and everything else, that this president, uh, and we've not had this where presidents uh, have uh, won, obviously President Obama had a strong black vote, but this was very strong in the turnout. And so the president uh, for both the uh, reasons of health and all is going to have an administrative structure that focuses on disparities, racism, uh, police behavior in almost every agency of, of, of the federal government. This is not just going to be a, an overview group. Uh, this is in every agency, the question is going to be asked, are you addressing racial disparities? And it's important to realize that how much voting mattered. So yes, the demonstrations of Black Lives Matter absolutely changed and made this issue much more salient uh, to many people. But the turnout of black voters for this president has absolutely just laid on his desk 
you owe us to address these very big problems. And so we're going to see this in everything, every committee, every commission, uh, the FBI investigating uh, police activities. But it's not just that they're disparities, it's that this president would not have been president if black leaders haven't decided that they would support him. And that's just important to realize lots of issues will be small and targeted, but this president knows uh, that those voters came out and kept him in this uh, uh, race and they want to see their lives changed by government. So this is going to be something that's going to be seen. And because the health disparities are very large, it will show up in administrative decisions and discussions across health agencies. Now it can sweep yeah. back. I think we've already seen one sign of that, what Bob just said about the racial justice being um, you know, part of healthcare and how we think about healthcare and how we deliver healthcare. Um, I'm going to talk in a second about vaccines and, and reaching uh, those communities and making them feel safe and, um, and trusting is there's going to be that that's one task ahead. But, you know, most of the, um, you know, Biden had a six member um, coronavirus advisory group that was briefing him sometimes every often every day at least four times a week um since march um and that included vivek murthy who was the former surgeon general who was of indian descent and david kessler who was the former fga uh, chair and um commissioner and um he just set up a larger coronavirus advisory group and then a bunch of subgroups and it's three people at the top it's vivek murthy it's David Kessler. And the third person had not been that prominently involved or publicly involved. I don't know if she was, you know, texting Joe Biden, um, <laughs> but she's a, she's a professor of medicine at Yale and yes. she is uh, uh, Marcella Nunez Smith. Um, she is, she is the, she became the new, I forgot the exact, was a title almost as long as Bob's, but it was the, the head of the equity research um, good program at Yale School of Medicine. And she is the third person on the advisory. So this is a black physician who studies, um, um, she may be, I haven't met her yet or talked to her yet. I mean, she's from the Virgin Islands, so she's also Caribbean. Um, she, she um, she studies this. She is a practicing physician. She's very involved in her in various boards and so forth in New Haven. So she is bringing expertise, commitment, and visibility just by being one of the top three. And I think that's a really um, major point. I do. I mean, I do um, want to, to talk briefly because we don't have that much time. I mean, obviously, the news about vaccines is really good. You know, whether it's going to when we get more data, is it's going to be 94 percent or 85? I don't know. You know, may not be quite as good as this early study, but it looks really good. Right. And there's a couple of other vaccines in the pipeline. There are issues of scarcity. There are global and domestic issues of allocation. Who gets it? When do they get it? But, you know, the Moderna one is looking very, you know, we're going to hear about Moderna, too. It's, it's that one's a really easier one to manufacture a lot of fast. You know, we have to make sure we have enough needles and glass bottles and you know all that other stuff. But obviously, I think everybody is feeling, you know, maybe this is next spring. Things will start getting better, not a year from now. And I think going into this winter is a little easier knowing that we have these hopes. But yeah, I mean, anti-vaxxers, um, uh, you, it, vaccines don't work if people don't take them. I, I sort of see three categories. There's a really hardcore anti-vaccine population. And most of them, you're not going to convince they won't take vaccines. But not everybody who's anti, quote, anti-vax, and they don't, you know, in fairness, it's a large group of people who has hesitancy or fears or worries about vaccines. And they're not all as hardcore as that, as committed to never taking a vaccine. Some of the people who have what we call vaccine hesitancy, you know, if, they're, if they don't want to give their kid a measles shot because they, they worry about side effects, um, are they going to weigh the risks and benefits of coronavirus differently? This is killing, you know, we're back up to, I think over, you know, over a thousand people a day. People are worried, people are worried about their relatives, people are worried about the economy. The, the risks, as you say, you know, measles shot, no measles shot versus corona vaccine or no corona vaccine, people may make that calculation differently. And then there's a third category of people who are pro-vaccine, who normally feel safe, but they were worried about Trump pushing through something that wasn't safe and effective. And I think that that, um, both because the, in, in fairness to the FDA, which you made some questionable calls about drugs, they fought back on the vaccine safety and efficacy standards to Trump. And they, you know, about a couple of weeks ago, they said, we are putting these guidelines out. And Trump said, no, you're not. And they said, yes, we are. 
So I think that they exerted some background, uh, some backbone. Some of the senior scientists there said, I will quit rather than approve an unsafe vaccine. And then I think just the election, you know, I think some of the people who didn't trust the uh, Trump pushed vaccine are going to feel safer about Trump may still be president when the when the FDA okays it because it may be just a few more weeks. But I just think the sort of the different climate. So there's um, there's sort of three different categories. And, um, you know, I mean, we're not studying this for two or three years. There are going to be some safety concerns we can't answer. But again, that's the risk benefit. You know, we are in a global pandemic killing a lot of people. And, you know, in America, we're losing the equivalent of like, you know, two or three jets full of people a day. And that's just us. It's around the world. You know, the death rate is is humongous. So, um, yeah, I think people, you know, we had to do this one faster and we did it remarkably fast. I mean, getting a vaccine in a year is pretty incredible. Why don't we take just a couple of the questions before? I've been been taking them out of here. Um, uh, Bob, Supreme Court. Quick, quick. What do you, th- and then let's, talk, let's wrap up with what uh, you think. So, uh, th- uh, and one more from the audience th- we'll wrap uh, up with. This is uh, easy on the, the uh, first part. I have believed all the way along that the Supreme Court would not strike down the Affordable Care Act. I've o- always been on that other column. There are lo- lots of reasons and in the, in the hearings for the, the new justice, uh, uh, there was a supportive nature of severability uh, that was strong. So the, the thing I just uh, uh, want to alert people, the abortion issue is going to be very different. And so uh, I, I could see, and again, because you do politics, striking down Roe versus Wade, I, I think is unlikely. I think allowing states, and there are probably about a dozen really very strong restrictive abortion states, to pretty much limit it in any way they can and still be called within Roe versus Wade is likely to happen. And we could wake up that there's a share of America where abortion is available in almost every circumstance. Uh, And then there's a a share of America where it's almost impossible for most people to get abortion. And it rolls over also in the support support for Planned Parenthood, just as you said before, internationally, uh, uh, domestically, uh, what can they do? Can states restrict it? So that is going to be one of the biggest uh, issues. Uh, but I have uh, uh, felt in a world where predictions have not been very good, I don't think they're going to strike down the Supreme Court, uh, the uh, Affordable Care Act. But the Planned Parenthood issue is also something that Biden or his, his health secretary yes. can address administratively. Um, the, the changes to Title 10. Yes. Um, were administrative or through rulemaking, the limits on, on Planned Parenthood, the attempt to defund um, Planned Parenthood, which it, it prevent them from taking Medicaid, kicking them out of Medicaid. All that is something that Biden can can stop. Um, maybe not all of that, but most of that. because There's some things going on at the state level. So Biden can reverse that defunding of Planned Parenthood. And the other thing we didn't get to is that the current administration has also changed non-discrimination rules, which affect gay and transgender people in the healthcare system. Um, I believe it also affects translation services and for patients who don't speak English as a native language. Um, And that can be, but the other thing is I just asked about the Supreme Court. Remember everything ends up on the court. Everything gets challenged. There are very, you know, everything Trump tried to do with challenge in court, some things got through, some things stopped. You expect a lot of legal arguments over over Biden. Now, some of what he's going to do is revert to what already what had been approved by the courts earlier. So, some of it will be easy. Some of it will not be. The healthcare lawyer is a very lucrative, uh, not not always lucrative, but it is a very. You will always have a mission in life if you are a healthcare lawyer. Um, and um, I think they they want us to wrap up probably. I, um, yes. I, so I think that since we've already gone over, um, that includes the discussion about the 2020 elections and its impact on health policy. Thank you, Bob. Thank you for the viewers. We did try to get in a lot of your questions, as many as I could. I, I did not know the answer to um, 1965 public health funding, nor did I know the answer to clinical trials for rare diseases under the new FDA. So we'll, we'll come back to that in the future. Um, Please join the forum again this coming Tuesday at noon Eastern for a discussion about the coronavirus pandemic, mental health fatigue, the holidays, and resiliency. And be well. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me.